So let me know when we want to start. Okay. Uh, yeah, sure. So, uh, sir, are we going to start or? I think uh, Gopal's uh, net had some issues. Uh, I think okay. he should be oh, coming okay. back, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, and Dr. Raju, uh, is he here? No, he's here. I'll just, I'll just okay. call him. Okay, sure. Dr. Gopal has got some issues. He's trying to get in once again. Okay. So Charu, you are a faculty member at um, uh, IIIT. Yeah, yeah, Triple IT. Yeah. yeah, so I've completed my PhD from IIT Hyderabad, and I'm a faculty at Triple IT Hyderabad. Right now. Very nice. So, what is your uh, expertise? Uh, so, uh, overall, I would say machine learning, deep learning, but uh, it's mostly like geometric machine learning, graph, mm -hmm. neural networks, and all. Yeah. Sounds very good, yeah. <laughs> there is also a bit Spilani in Hyderabad, right? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> yes, yes, yes. Yeah, bit Spilani Hyderabad campus, yeah. Mm.
Professor Abhika, I think <coughs> Professor Gopal has got some serious issues. Maybe you can start by asking to conclude the session. Uh, okay, so maybe I will uh, first yeah. uh, introduce. Uh, okay, uh, so yeah, welcome everyone. So we are, uh, why are we here? So maybe I'll just uh, give a brief background. So today is an international day for uh, uh, women and uh, uh, girls in science and technology. So which is celebrated on 11th February. And uh, uh, that's why we are here. And um, uh, so basically, uh, in order to recognize the role of women and girls playing science and technology, so that's why we have this online event today. We have two sessions today by three uh, eminent women scientists. And we are happy to have Professor Vijayalakshmi at Luri from Rutgers University and uh, Dr. Gunjan Batra from Kennesaw State University. And in the second session, we have Professor Bhavani Thuraisingam from University of Texas, Dallas. Uh, and uh, OK. So uh, my name is Charu Sharma. I'm a faculty at IIIT, and uh, I'll be uh, moderating the session. So the first session is on uh, attribute-based uh, access control program by Professor uh, Vijay Atluri and Dr. Gunjan Batra. So I'll just introduce the other speakers, and then I'll uh, uh, let them take over the session. So uh, Professor Vijay is a professor of computers, uh, computer information systems in the MSIS department, co-director of the Masters in Information Technology and Analytics, and research director for the Center for Information Management, Integ Integration, and Connectivity at Rutgers University. Her research interests include information security, privacy, databases, workflow management, uh, spatial databases, and distributed systems. She has published over 200 technical papers in these areas. She served as the vice chair for the ACM uh, special interest group on security audit and chair of the IFIP WG 11.3 working group on data and application security. Her uh, editorial board service includes ACM computing surveys, IEEE transactions on dependable and uh, secure computing, Journal of Computer Security, International Journal on Digital Libraries, International Journal on uh, Journal of uh, Information and Computer Security, and IEEE Transactions on Knowledge and Data Engineering. She was the recipient of Nation, uh, National Science Foundation Career Award in 1996, uh, 96 Rutgers University Research Award for Untenured Faculty for Outstanding Research Contributions in 1999. Uh, outstanding Research Award from IFIFP, uh, WG Data and Application Security and Privacy in 2014, and Dean's Meritorious Research Award in two, 2017. So uh, that was about Professor Vijay. And uh, Dr. Gunjan uh, Batra is an Assistant Professor of uh, Information Security and Assurance in Coles College of Business at Kennesaw State University, USA. She completed her doctoral degree from Rutgers University under the supervision of Professor Vijay and Professor Jadeep Vedya. Uh, her research interests include information security, uh, information system security, access control, information systems audit, data privacy, and data analytics. She has multiple research publications in these areas. And uh, prior to her PhD, she worked as a consultant at KPMG in uh, their IT advisory practice helping clients with information security related issues. Uh, uh, she is also certified, uh, also a certified information systems auditor. And she likes to, uh, uh, she enjoys traveling, uh, playing table tennis and swimming. So that's about our uh, speakers of the day. And uh, we are happy to have you here and uh, very uh, much welcome to the event. And um, I'll, I'll invite you to take over the session. So I, uh, audience can ask uh, questions. So so how would you, ma'am, how would you like to take the questions like in the middle of the session? Is it OK or from the chat or in the end? Yeah, that would be fine. That would be fine. OK, so maybe I think it's best that audience can ask questions in the chat or maybe by raising hands. So looking forward to an interactive session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, first of all, for inviting me 
to speak at this uh, important uh, event. You know, um, today is an international, as you said, women's and girls uh, day in science, you know. So I'm very happy to contribute to this um, uh, session. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Raju, and uh, for inviting me for this, you know. And thanks for the very nice introduction that you gave, uh, Dr. Charu Sharma. You know? So uh, this uh, talk is about, um, uh, we thought, you know, we will give some idea of um, um, our contributions um, uh, to um, um, maybe mentoring women in science. Uh, so maybe I'll give a very brief introduction about my own experiences with that. And Dr. Batra will also talk about uh, her experiences. Then we will uh, talk about some of the recent research that we have jointly done um, which is uh, on attribute-based access control, uh, the new paradigm um, um, uh, uh, to, pr to provide um, uh, or to secure uh, data. So this, um, we, we talk about uh, some of the challenges and maybe one solution uh, towards this end. So let me just... Uh, I, I just want to play this. Okay, so I, I hope all of you can see this. So, um, so actually Dr. Gunjan Batra, um, she finished her as uh, Dr. Charu said, uh, her uh, PhD from Rutgers University uh, last year. So this is actually part of her work. So let me just a little bit, um, um, you introduced me anyway, so I'll just skip it through. I actually graduated from um, George Mason University where I got my PhD and my master's was from IIT Kharagpur and um, my undergraduate degree is from JNTU Kakinada. So I have been with Rutgers uh, since 1994, since my graduation. And I have been working in this area of security and privacy for over 30 years. Uh, I also served as a program director at the National Science Foundation uh, for a couple of years uh, in the SATC program that is um, secure and trustworthy um, uh, program, you know, like uh, trustworthy computing programs at C. And I also, worked for a few years in the, at NIST National Institute for Standards and Technology. Currently, I am actually serving on the Computer Science Advisory Board of the University of the People, uh, which is a free university that uh, uh, offers free education to underrepresented groups and uh, people who are not able to get formal education, uh, the, those who are not as fortunate as many of us. So currently they actually expanded um, uh, this to even Afghanistan, you know, and women were able to participate or rather take, uh, take courses or uh, enroll in these programs in um, anonymous way, you know. So, uh, this is very, um, I'm very proud to be part of this uh, endeavor. And um, let me actually uh, skip this part because Dr. Charu already mentioned it. So over these uh, 30 years um, um, at Rutgers, I have actually um, had the opportunity to mentor uh, 19 PhD students who graduated. And uh, among them, um, almost 50% of them uh, are actually female students. Um, so since this is um, talking about women in sense, I, just, I thought I would just bring this up. So, so the first, my very first female student was Dr. Sun Chen. 
she is now um, a professor at City University of New York. And Lee Shin, uh, she graduated in 2005. So currently she is uh, a professor and chair of the Department of Marketing Information Systems Decision Sciences at uh, FDU, Farley Dickinson University, that is in New Jersey. Uh, Song Mei Yu, she is uh, a professor in the computer science department at Felician University. Uh, Di Hua Gu, uh, she is working as a data scientist at Johnson & Johnson. And Vandana Janeja, uh, she is uh, a professor and chair in the department of information systems at University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And Janice Warner, uh, she is currently serving as the provost uh, and professor at Georgian Court University in New Jersey. Uh, Nazia Bader, uh, she is an information decision sciences department working as um, uh, a professor there, uh, California State University, San Bernardino. Uh, Sadhana Jha, uh, she is um, at uh, an assistant professor, Department of Computer Science and Information Systems uh, uh, at BITS Pilani, India. Uh, she actually graduated from IIT Kharagpur. Um, Gunjana Batra, <laughs> you will hear from her. Uh, she is uh, she she is my latest uh, student who graduated. Uh, she is now currently an assistant professor in the Department of information systems um, and security at Kansas State University. So uh, this is all I want to talk about. And maybe Gunjan, uh, you can talk about your uh, background and... Thank you, Dr. Vijay. Thank you all for uh, inviting us to this uh, event. Um, so a little background about uh, myself uh, in this slide. I am an assistant professor in Department of Information Systems and Security, Coles College of Business at Kennesaw State University. And um, as Dr. Vijay already said that I am her student, I completed her, uh, I'm her PhD student and I completed my PhD from Rutgers University last year. Um, prior to PhD, I uh, did MBA uh, from Delhi Technological University in India and uh, completed my BTEC from uh, Guru Gobind Singh in the Prast University in India. And uh, most of my experience uh, has been in the area of security and privacy, uh, be it my uh, research, PhD research, and the research I'm conducting now, or uh, my uh, past uh, experience in the industry. Um, uh, so I will be talking about the research problems uh, which I worked on during my PhD and current problems. And um, my industrial experience was in IT advisory team, um, uh, primarily doing risk consulting for clients, helping out, uh, helping them out in auditing their systems and uh, securing their systems, developing uh, IT infrastructure up to standards and, you know, helping them set up their governance, IT governance structures and uh, yeah, and then uh, prior to KPMG, I also worked at Altran Group as an engineer um, in their uh, telecom um, services department. Thank you. So uh, we thought uh, we would uh, uh, discuss a little bit about based on about access control, what exactly it means, and how we uh, uh, got to the new access control model like attribute based access control. So um, um, we were asking Dr. Raju about the background of the audience. Maybe uh, it may be a good idea to start from the beginning and give a little bit introduction of um, uh, traditional access control like discretionary and role based access control models. And then we will talk about what is ABAC, the new access control uh, paradigm and some of the challenges um, uh, that uh, are encountered uh, in deploying or using this new access control uh, model uh, that Gunjan will talk about and, and I will talk about the uh, introduction, introductory slides. So, so what is actually access control? 
So this is actually the fundamental component of secure, uh, securing a system. So when a user submits uh, uh, an access request to the system, the system would either uh, allow him to access, him or her to access, or deny access. So this is, uh, uh, this is done by using what are called the actual authorizations or the security policies, also called access control policies that dictate whether a particular user can access a particular resource in the system. So when a user submits an access request, uh, he or she uh, is either denied access or allowed access. So typically these access control systems, you uh, come across these systems all, uh, all along in your uh, regular operating systems or database management systems or any application software, maybe like SAP or something. So that you are using today. So, uh, so let us see um, uh, a typical basic access control system, how it looks like. So the access control rules are specified or uh, uh, are written in terms of just three parameters. What is called a subject or the user, a resource called an object. So what you are uh, protecting and the mode of access, whether it is read mode, write mode, execute mode, delete, create, search, index, uh, select, if you are in the database, select, update, uh, insert. So these are all the access control, access modes in which a user, a subject is allowed to access a, an object. So this is uh, called a triple. So S, O, and P, S, S, O, P, the triple that is used, um, that we call as an access control policy. So this is how traditionally the basic uh, mechanisms work. So uh, in this access control basic structure, uh, when a subject requests access to an object, there is always what is called a reference monitor or a software program that uh, evaluates the request. And then uh, by using these policies, the SOP, the triple, uh, the list of such policies that are stored in the system and allows the user or the subject to access an object or denies. So this is a very simple or simplistic view of how uh, access requests can be stored. So as, in a matrix form, access control matrix form. So subjects on one side and objects on the other side and you can write down the permissions here. Uh, typically, what you mean by here is if you look at the first cell, user A is, uh, is the owner of file one. Uh, user A is allowed to read and write file one, et cetera. So you can figure it out. So just stop me uh, uh, whenever you have questions. So such access control uh, uh, model is what is what we call it as a discretionary access control model. So who actually writes or fills this matrix is dependent on who the owner is. So owner at his or her own discretion can give away permissions on the resources that the owner actually owns. So for example, uh, file one is owned by user A, Obviously, he or she can read and write. Uh, she can give away the permissions to user B, another user, at her own discretion. So this is what we call discretionary access control. Uh, so typically, uh, that means users can protect what they own. So the owner may grant access to other users. So typically, this is, um, uh, this is where access rights or access permissions, how they propagate from one subject to another subject in a more or less an uncontrolled uh, manner because users at their own discretion can give away permissions on their own. Um, so the, the next uh, access control model 
Of course, there are other models as well. We are just talking about a few of them, couple of them here. So what is called the uh, uh, famous role-based access control uh, 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 model. So in which, uh, suppose if you go back to our discretionary access control, um, what happens here if you are trying to define th things of this way? If you have a large number of users and large number of resources, so this becomes a humongous task and the actual access control mechanism becomes uh, uh, administering it and you know managing it and taking care of the changes becomes a um, uh, administrative nightmare. So in case of that large organizations where you have a large number of users and large number of objects and a large number of authorization, uh, security administration becomes really challenging. Uh, whenever uh, users change, these, uh, these uh, uh, permissions need to be re uh, changed. You have to grant new permissions or existing permissions uh, have to be revoked. So the role-based access control uh, paradigm or this access control model attempts to simplify the security administration. So how does it actually uh, do this? So in, in this case, roles, we introduce what is called roles. They represent actually job functions within an organization. So you collect the permissions that are given to users, collect them or these permissions as a set of, set of these permissions and define that as a role. So then these roles are actually assigned to users. And this is a very quite a very natural way of uh, allowing users to access resources. So uh, in the earlier uh, traditional access control model, there is no notion of role. Users are given uh, permissions on objects directly. Now we, we have a, another level of indirection added. Users are assigned to roles and roles are nothing but a set of permissions. So when a user needs to access a particular resource an ob or an object, uh, he or she needs to uh, invoke his or her role, um, um, or rather log in, uh, in, in, in that role, and thereby he will uh, automatically gain access to those uh, permissions. So a user may have, may play multiple roles and multiple users uh, play a single role as you can see here. So this particular user is uh, playing role two as well as role three and role three is played by um, other people. So they are by just invoking a role, a user can actually access the permissions. So this is the role-based access control uh, paradigm as I mentioned to you. The benefits of this uh, is that security administration becomes um, uh, much simpler compared to the traditional discretionary access control. And organizational policy, since roles represent organization functions, this model can directly support the policies of the organization saying that, oh, this particular person, clerk, can access this. Clerk is a role and all you need to do is when a particular user leaves the organization, the permissions of the clerk remain the same. They are static. Only thing that you need to change is who is now playing the role of the clerk. So that is why granting and revoking um, uh, authorizations or permissions given to users uh, is greatly simplified. So this is uh, the benefit of RBAC. And NIST or the National Institute for Standards and Technology, which dictates all standards. So this is the NIST uh, uh, role-based access control uh, model in which you can say users are assigned to roles called UEA and roles are given permissions, which are nothing but um, an operation done on an object. And uh, a user logs into a particular session to invoke a role. And they also allow what is called role hierarchies, 
where uh, the roles, the relationship between different roles, uh, uh, role one can be higher level than role two. For example, a supervisor can be a, a higher, uh, playing a higher level role than that of a clerk. So where, where um, the permissions that are assigned to the clerk can be actually inherited by a higher level role supervisor. So this is how uh, the NIST uh, standard uh, specifies. So let me just turn it over to uh, Gunjan, uh, who will uh, talk about the actual gist of our, uh, our contribution here. You know, th this is what we want to focus on, the ABAC. You know? So please ask me any questions if you have. Thank you. So Gunjan, you. you want to open your own I'm copy? Or uh, I'm going to request yeah, yeah, yeah. control. OK. That okay. I'll stop sharing, yeah. Oh, yes. Give me a Yeah, we can see. So you can see in presentation mode, right? Yes, yes, you can see. All right. So I'm going to start with attribute based access control. Now, so just there is one question. Uh, let me answer the question. Uh, Uh, it is actually a very, very good question. If user has multiple roles, will there be cases of access conflicts? Yes, indeed. You know, um, uh, when uh, I, I actually did not get into all these details, but we uh, uh, there is a, a notion called the separation of duty. Uh, so these are called the constraints. So you may want to actually impose these constraints when you actually define roles. For example, uh, let us say you are playing a role of um, uh, an instructor um, as a research assistant. And at the same time, you are also a student. So a student acts as an instructor. Um, so you can define a constraint saying uh, you cannot play both the role of a student as well as an instructor at the same time in the same session. So for, but that means for the same, for one course, you cannot be an instructor as well as, um, uh, as, well as uh, a student. So the, the, the conflicts uh, exist, of course, and you have to define them in advance. And you have to make sure that you don't uh, allocate uh, users uh, to conflicting roles. Uh, these can be dynamic uh, conflicts or they can be just static conflicts. Uh, so the, the example that I gave you is a dynamic conflict where in a particular session, you cannot play the role of an instructor and a student, but you can be an instructor in one course and uh, a student in another course. So I hope I answered your question. Okay, thank you. So I'll go ahead, uh, if there are no further questions. Yeah, all right. All right, so in attribute-based access control, the access to perform an action on a resource by a user is based on the attributes of the user, the attributes of the object, the environment attributes, and the ABAC policy base, which is nothing but a set of uh, the set of attribute conditions which determine whether the user will be given access to an object or not. So uh, basically, uh, we uh, uh, we 
we store the user attribute information and object and attribute information in some form. And then when access request comes, we use that information to search through the ABAC policy rules and determine the decision of access. So this is a simple example of how ABAC policy is uh, written. As I said, ABAC policy is a set of rules which de which define the at subject, like the user ob attribute conditions and object attribute conditions. And if uh, we need the environment attribute conditions to decide um, the access. So the conditions are defined uh, as equalities, like attribute name is equal to attribute value. And this is a simple example of an ABAC policy where a cardiologist doctor is allowed access, both read-write access to patient records of cardiology department during time 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. So now in... Um, we're going to, when we represent it as an ABAC policy rule, uh, we're going to write it as uh, you can see, where our title equal, is equal to doctor, specialization is equal to cardiology. So these are subject attribute conditions that need to be uh, satisfied. Um, similarly, you know, type is equal to patient records and department is cardiology. So these are the object attribute conditions that need to be specific, uh, satisfied. And uh, these are all list of other possible attributes that you can have, um, you know, some uh, examples. So for example, in environment, we can have location, time, um, you know, any other uh, dynamic uh, attribute related to environment, which we want. And this is a simple example of how user uh, access will be determined. So suppose, uh, you know, we had this policy rule, which we saw uh, in our previous slide, where doctor was allowed read-write access to re patient records in their department. Now, there is a doctor who is specializing in, uh, you know, uh, uh, gynecology and is trying to read patient records uh, in cardiology department. The access will be denied. Now, if we have a doctor specializing in cardiology, so look now here, everything, all the attributes are matching. The doctor is in cardiology department, the patient um, records trying, which he or she is trying to access is in cardiology department, the environment. So it's 11 a.m. right now, the rule uh, said 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And so uh, uh, since all the attributes are satisfied, the access is granted as per the ABAC policy. Now, talking about benefits of ABAC. So now, as you saw with this form of access control, uh, you know, we have uh, the it, ABAC is a very dynamic uh, form of access control. It gives us so much flexibility. Um, and because that, uh, because access is determined with attributes and not it's not tied to specific users, it's an identity-less form of access control. And this feature actually makes it very portable and scalable. We don't need users or objects. The, 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 the access decision is made at the time, uh, you know, a user requests for access. And uh, a decision is based on the attributes of the user and the attributes of the object um, which they're trying to access. And uh, another benefit of ABAC over uh, the previous role-based access control is that whenever you know in uh, there is a customization uh, in a role required a certain a, a small change required we need to create a new role in organizations so now uh, with that we have um, an in infinite number of we can have infinite number of roles in an organization with every small customization that comes in. So if we have simple rules uh, that can uh, so, uh, you know give us the same uh, uh, access uh, uh, management, uh, it will actually help us solve that problem. So now I'm going to talk about uh, the problem of ABAC policy mining. This is our joint work with uh, Dr. Jaydi Pedya from Rutgers University and uh, Dr. Shamik Sural from IIT Kharagpur. Um, now, uh, why do we need ABAC policy mining? Now, uh, 
whenever uh, you know we uh, we we have we have a traditional system with our bag dac or any other uh, form of access control and an organization decides that hey you know we want to move to a bag that is the time we are we want to figure out what policy rules we want to have so that's a, a motivation for a bag mining number one now whenever a new user enters an organization um uh, you know or there are new set of users in an organization how do we determine that what rules we should configure in this uh, should be there in the system which will determine access for that rules uh, for that user or um and then uh, the next thing is that when um you know these days there is a lot of collaboration happening amongst organizations in clouds uh then we need an identity for all as form uh, of access control and simplified form where you know we can just specify the rules and uh, a collaboration can be worked out simply so that that's another um uh, situation when we uh, we we could need a back mining now what a back mining actually does for us it will automatically deter uh, discover the a back policy rules which is nothing but a set of the set of attribute conditions which are uh, required of uh, uh, which we need to determine access for a user to an object so basically we will have or uh, we have our set of authorizations you know we know uh, we know what user has access to which object and we know uh, the attribute um, what user specifies uh, what user satisfies what uh, attribute condition in the user attribute relation and similarly we have the object um, you know at uh, object attribute information in the o o object attribute relation and then we use our abac policy mining algorithm to find out abac policy rules in such a way that the abac policy rules are minimum and they satisfy all the uh, you know the permissions which are allowed by the rules are same as the authorizations which were originally in the system so basically we have all this information in our system uh, before we use the, the abac policy mining algorithm to determine the abac policy rules which will eventually be used now this is another simple example on how we are uh, arriving at our algorithm so these are a set of users in an organization as you can see there is a nurse uh, with cardio in cardiology with cardio specialty in cardiology a doctor with specialty in medicine now with these is this is all the attribute information of the users how are we going to store it in our system now this is this is the form where how how so we have users in all the rows and the attribute conditions in the column so it's a mapping of users to uh, their attribute to the attribute conditions and then it's a binary matrix which tells us you know if a user satisfies this attribute conditions then we have a one here and uh, if not then we have a zero now similarly we do the we do the same thing for objects so this is these are the two objects where we have we are storing patient records in cardiology department and medicine department these are their attribute conditions which they satisfy and now we are storing them in the object attribute relation like this now this slide shows the authorization information so basically the uh, nurses uh, are having read access and the doctors are having read write access uh, to the patient records and this is a system admin john um so the authorization information as you can see which tells us that which user has access to which object and for which what type of operation so now uh, coming back uh, you know we have all this information originally in our system on which we are, we want to perform or on which we want to use the abac policy mining algorithm and find out abac policy rules um 
we uh, use this information to develop a user object permission matrix. This is a pre-step to, uh, you know, uh, developing uh, uh, to using our ABAC policy mining algorithm, which we will see how we develop later. Um, and this will this is the uh, uh, data structure on which we are going to run the policy mining algorithm. Now the point: how to how are we going to develop it? So uh, feel free to stop me if you have any questions or uh, you know are uh, would like to know the flow much better um so basically we convert all the authorizations and the user attribute uh, attribute information now all the uh, rows in the uop they are all the possible combinations of users and objects so you can see all the users with the, the first file and the all the users with second file so all possible combinations the columns are all possible attribute conditions. And here, uh, the last one is for operation. And then again, it's a, a matrix of zeros and ones, which tells us that, uh, you know, which user uh, is satisfying which attribute condition. And now the operation, which is operation column comes from the authorization matrix. So uh, it tells us which user has access to which object. Uh, in zeros and ones. So we develop this matrix simply. On this matrix, we perform the a, uh, we uh, we use our ABAC mining algorithm yeah. and arrive at the ABAC uh, policy rules like this here. So as you can see, we we will arrive at these rules where speciality when the speciality is medicine and the department is medicine, we can simply read, and when the title is doctor and uh, you know, uh, speciality is cardio and department is cardio. The doctors can write and the nurses or anybody in the system, doctors and nurses, they both can read. Let's combine item number and model name. So in DSI, there will be only one unique. Um, can you please repeat? I did not. The... Two scenarios, the gynec may need to access the patient's cardiology records, which she does not have, how or she would get the permission. So if we want to configure that in our system, we will define uh, uh, an ABAC rule for it. And in pharma uh, research manufacturing, usually researchers are allowed to record their research observations, uh, but not edit. And even the day-to-day -day, uh, calibrations of all machines used are also to be recorded in uh, e-notebook. The supervisors own, also have read. Yes, of course, uh, ABAC system will come in handy here. We uh, just need to change the configuration of our rules uh, as per the requirement. And in fact, if we are going more uh, granular, uh, you know, and uh, more, uh, we can fine tune our system. And that's uh, the benefit of ABAC. Thank you. Okay, so how did we uh, uh, how did we develop the ABAC mining algorithm? Now I'm jumping to the uh, now I'm moving on to the approach. Now we discovered uh, that after looking at the UOP that the problem of ABAC policy mining is same as discovering functional dependencies in that in the UOP which we had, um, where the you uh, all these attribute conditions they are the determinants. And uh, the uh, the operations is the dependent. So operation is basically dependent on all these attribute conditions. And we will find the ABAC rules, uh, which is the, at, the set of these attribute conditions, which will help us determine whether this operation will be allowed or not. So basically our goal is to discover ABAC policy rules and um, uh, we, we are going to uh, discover the combination of attribute conditions which are present when the operation is present. And there shouldn't be any case in the UOP where those attribute conditions are present and still there is the operation is not present. So the access is not granted. The access should always be granted when those attribute conditions exist. And that's our goal. So, and that's the base uh, of this um, 
of the solution. So we basically came up with two approaches, uh, ABAC uh, FDM and ABAC SRM. Now ABAC FDM is uh, helps us is based on discovering functional dependencies in the UOP database. So we discover the functional dependencies in different iterations of I. In the first iteration, we will, um, uh, I mean, in every iteration, we uh, we control the count of uh, user attribute conditions, which we are checking for a functional dependency with the operation. So for example, in the first one, we will check only one uh, attribute condition at a time for functional dependency. And then after we, uh, you know, um, uh, do this, we sort the functional, after we find out the functional dependencies, we sort them based on the, the rows they are covering in the UOP and um, then perform a greedy selection of the F uh, functional dependencies at each, each iteration. And I'm going to show this to you with an example. So this is an example uh, UOP with the, you know, all the user object, um, uh, all combinations of user objects uh, in the rows, uh, the conditions in the columns and the uh, operation here, which tells us the access is allowed or not. So now in the iteration one, we will just check one uh, attribute condition. If this has uh, a functional dependency with the operation or not. Uh, we could not find any. So uh, if, we, if we check individually, we cannot find a functional dependency. So individually, I mean, you see one uh, or, or next we check, you see two, you see three and so on. You see is the user attribute condition and OC is the object attribute condition. Now in iteration two, we check two at a time. So you see one and you see two, if the, these two have a functional dependency with the operation or not, or, uh, you know, and so on, basically. So we found that uh, UC3 and OC2 have a functional dependency uh, with the operation. Whenever these two are one, the operation is also one always. So we include that uh, in our uh, candidate functional dependencies. And similarly, you know, UC3 and OC3, which you see in green. So, uh, and we also uh, keep track of the number of rows these are covering. Then to perf uh, perform a greedy selection, we uh, pick the functional dependency with the highest coverage. And, uh, you know, since this one is already covering the row below, so that's our um, a pick for now. Next, we in our third iteration, we will check three attributes at a time. So then we discovered that uh, UC1, UC2, and OC1 have a functional dependency with the operation. So um, again, with now three, uh, keeping three attribute conditions, at a time, we figured out how, uh, like what the functional dependencies will be and discover, found out the coverage and, uh, you know, selected the functional dependencies. So this is our uh, final set of uh, functional uh, dependencies. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, now we can see, we can see that all the rows with the operation as one are covered. And we keep on doing this process until all the rows are covered. Now this is our second approach, ABAC SRM. And uh, for this, the idea is the base is same. We are discovering functional dependencies, but now with the functional dependency approach, the problem was, you know, it's uh, the, uh, the complexity is exponential. We, it's, uh, so that takes, uh, the, with large data set, it will take a long time to execute. With SRM, um, uh, the idea is that we pick all the user attribute combinations that lead to uh, operation zero. Uh, we uh, discard all of their subsets. So no, they are also not allowed access, that subsets are also not allowed access. And for the uh, combinations that lead to operation one, we discard if they are already covered in existing rules. And our, otherwise, uh, we use their intersection with existing rules to find a smaller rule. And um, uh, now, uh, basically, uh, for every, we check for every user attribute uh, combination in the UOP, we check if the rule is, uh, as I said, covered by a pre existing rule or if, you know, uh, intersection of the rule with pre existing rules, we check that. 
and if that is uh, uh, you know if it gives additional zero permissions we discard it and uh, otherwise uh, you know if not we delete the rule from the rule list and insert the in intersection so let me explain it to you with an example so that it's uh, more clear now this is the uop so to start with we uh, you know uh, separate the uop into permission zero rows and permission one rows and uh, next is we sort all the permission one row so this is what we are going to be working on the permission one rows they will help us determine the rows now from the permission one rows we go on so, so from the first row we select the attribute conditions here um, this comes in directly and the rule now moving on to the second row in the permission one table the rule one uh, is not covering the second row so we uh, take intersection of this uh, uh, the second row with rule one and check if it's part of permission zero list or not so since it is uh, you know the intersection is in the permission zero table we discard it and uh, we uh, directly include the second row here in our uh, candidate uh, in the selected uh, functional dependencies now um, the third row here uh, is already being covered by the first row so we have uc1 uc2 and uh, oc1 oc2 so this is a superset of this row since this rule is already uh, the uh, row is already being covered so we skip it now the fourth uh, row um, basically this is uh, uc1 uc3 oc2 and oc1 so we check if it is already being covered um, you know since it's not being covered then we start taking intersections with the rules and see if it's in the zero list if uh, you know since we find the intersection we uh, put it back here and now the next step will be we want to shorten all all the rules and uh, see if you know by removing attributes we see if it's part of the permission zero list or not and if it's if it is we uh, do not keep, uh, shorten it if it is not then we can easily shorten the rules so basically we arrive at these uh, minimum possible set of uh, rules with uh, you know me, uh, least possible uh, structure uh, you know least possible number of attributes in every rule and then um, well, these are our final set of rules. So basically, we, uh, to just conclude what all we discussed, we presented two approaches for mining ABAC policies, ABAC uh, functional dependency, minor FDM, and um, SRM. Now, uh, with SRM, the worst case complexity is uh, cubic. And this will take significantly less time, um, you know, compared to FDM. And uh, we compared it to the uh, current, uh, you know, the state of the art more, uh, other algorithms. It generates the same number of rules and takes very less time compared to other algorithms. And uh, in our research work, we also proved that ABAC policy mining problem is NP hard. Now, there are many other research problems uh, which we also, uh, you know, looked at. And uh, one of them is ABAC policy maintenance. So uh, we discover these ABAC policy rules. But what happens over time? Like, you know, uh, rules will change. Uh, for example, you know, you had that uh, question. So suppose we want to add gynec to our access uh, to provide the gynec access to cardiology department patients. Now, how th that's an update in our policy. So how are we going to take care of these updates is the question so we are trying, we addressed here. So which is ABAC policy maintenance. Then we also looked at ABAC policy reconciliation and migration in a collaborative setting where, where we have different organizations with ABAC policies. How are we going to uh, come agree at a common um, axel, uh, common rule set? How do we reconcile ABAC policies? Or even you know decide if we want to migrate to one particular organization's ABAC policy. Then we also looked at uh, deploying uh, of ABAC policies in current RBAC systems because a lot of organizations right now do not have ABAC systems. RBAC systems are more easily found. If you do not want to make the investment in ABAC, how do we deploy ABAC policies in current 
systems. Now, uh, then, uh, right, uh, currently we are looking at another problem where we are looking at uh, handling, uh, you know, access requests which are coming in uh, while the policy, uh, you know, is still having changes. Uh, so, how do we uh, immediately enforce any change in the Paul ABAC policy uh, where, you know, where uh, access requests are coming in? So, um, that's it from our side. If you have any questions, feel free. Okay, so I think there is one question in the chat. Okay, two questions. Yes. So, a role. yeah. So, I'm going to actually start with the first one. Is there a roadmap uh, for innovations of these kinds to be incorporated? into any of the standard organizations, ISO reference manuals on information security, for instance. Um, I, I, I do not have a direct, like- Actually, I, I uh, yeah. Actually, ABAC is an NIST standard. Uh, there is an ABAC model, right, Gunjan? Yeah. yeah. So the standard, but- yeah. That's why NIST, but do they have like, are they referring in uh, this in ISO uh, or, you know, mm -hmm. other? Uh, that I'm not. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. But now since, you know, uh, th th so th there is one thing I want to tell you. So, you know, because most now organizations are adopting ABAC and it's getting widely adopted, they are wanting standards uh, related to it. So, for example, when I was working at KPMG, they wanted to understand so that they, how to audit uh, ABAC systems. I mean, you know, um, their clients have, want ABAC systems, but then they want <laughs> So these are coming up. And uh, can't a role be an attribute? Yes, it can be an attribute. Uh, so that's another way ABEX system can be defined. We can configure a role as an attribute. And in um, uh, in a, like in a situation, every role can be an attribute. Uh, but then we are trying to solve the problem of role explosion. So we'll, the, we, our goal is that we have less number of ABAC rules for uh, you know, the number of roles. So um, that's what we are going to aim at. And how do you revoke any policy or attribute? Um, so if you if you want to remove an attribute from a user like if there is any attribute change in the user we even simply take it off from the user and uh, th this this is uh, the good thing about apac so the the access decisions are taken at enforcement uh, time so if the user comes in with that attribute which is required uh, as per the rule the user is granted access and otherwise it's not and uh, uh, right, yeah. And uh, we are also looking at this, uh, uh, this, uh, this is the question which uh, we are trying to answer in our work on incremental uh, ABAC maintenance. Yeah, yeah so, so uh, going back to the question of uh, how do you revoke any policy or attribute? So revocation means, you know, so, so for example, let us say, your attribute is um, you are a, a IIIT student. So that is your credential, that is your attribute. So when you graduate, you are no longer uh, a student of IIIT. So you are no longer uh, are allowed to actually access a particular system. So naturally your attributes are removed from you. So you don't have access. So there is no change that needs to be done at the policy level. So your actual attribute-based ABAC policy is only IIT students are allowed into this room. So by not having that attribute, but not by not possessing that attribute, you are naturally not allowed there. So there is no revocation here, you know. Uh, the policies don't need to change at all. So that is what when Gunjan said, oh, this is um, a flexible model and there is no maintenance at all. So coming to the very last question about, um, will that affect your policy mining? Yes, certainly, you know, if there are any changes, um, 
So that is the incremental maintenance work uh, that was uh, just published last uh, year in the CODASP, like uh, SEM conference data and application security. That is uh, what we are trying to address. Unfortunately, we don't have time to go into the details, but that is what happens you know, when there are changes in the uh, attribute assignments of users, how, um, uh, how would that reflect um, the changes in the policies? Um, I don't know if Gunjan, you want to add anything to that, uh, but going back to the ISO standard it is also um, what is called NGAC, that next generation access control uh, by NIST. Uh, that is a standard and this actually, uh, the ABAC actually, uh, um, the, the, the ABAC actually came out of the NGAC standard that was proposed, which uses attributes um, of users attributes of the objects and then the relationships between the two. So ABAC actually uh, came out of that original thinking, you know. So there is an NJAC standard. I know NIST folks are actually talking to ISO and other organizations uh, as well. So- Okay, I think, yeah. Um... If, if that's all, uh, yeah. do we have any other questions? So I cannot see any more questions so far. Yeah. So maybe I'll, I'll uh, just ask one question that I'm getting, although this is not my area, but I, I don't know if this is a correct question or not. But uh, when you were mentioning that we have some uh, patterns or something that based on this, this condition, we are finding out whether we have access to read or write. So I was trying to uh, connect this to the machine learning classification problem. So uh, I, I wanted to ask whether there is like, is it a learning kind of a problem or is it something else? Like, uh, can we apply that to here or not? We could apply that here, but not classification. I actually, uh, I'd say that it's a, uh, it's somewhere related to association um, kind of problem. Like association. Uh, yeah. Okay. So do that here, in my okay. opinion. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you uh, so much, Professor Atluri and uh, uh, Dr. Gunjan. So uh, thank you so much for the session. And uh, yeah, I'll uh, maybe like to uh, invite Professor Bhavani. And uh, we have uh, Dr. Radhika here. She is a faculty, she is a fac uh, associate professor at IIIT. And uh, she will be taking over uh, the next session, moderating the session. Uh, yeah. Radhika, ma'am, yeah, you're here. Okay, yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, th thank you so much, uh, Charu. Uh, so I, first of all, uh, thank uh, Dr. Vijay and Dr. Gunjan for such a wonderful session. So we move on to the next part of our uh, event today. Uh, that's, uh, I welcome Dr. Bhavani Sudai Singham, uh, whose talk on cyber security and machine learning is uh, what we are uh, waiting for. Uh, but before that, I would like to briefly introduce uh, Dr. Bhavani. So, uh, so uh, I hope uh, I can introduce uh, Dr. Bhavani, or would you like to go ahead? Uh, can I uh, can maybe, introduce you to the audience? Uh, if you can maybe say a few words, I'd rather you do it. Yeah. And then I'll, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So, so Dr. Bhavani Tudai Singham is the Founders uh, Chair Professor of Computer Science and the Executive Director of the Cyber Security Research and Education Institute at the University of Texas at Dallas. She's an elected fellow of the ACM, IEEE, uh, the AAAS and the NAI. Her research interests are on integrating cyber security and artificial intelligence data sciences for the past 36 years. She has received several awards, including IEEE CS 1997 Technical Achievement Award, ACM SIGSAC 2010 Outstanding Contributions Award, IEEE COMSOC Communications and Information Security 2019 Technical Recognition Award, IEEE CS Services Computing 2017 Research Innovation Award, 
ACM Kodaspi 2017 Lasting Research Award. She also co-chaired the Women in Cybersecurity Conference as well as uh, WITS Conference at uh, Stanford University, CyberW, iMentor, etc. She received the Women in Technology Award from the Dallas Business Journal in 2017 and also is the recipient of IEEE Cybersecurity and Cloud's 2021 Special Recognition Award for her tireless work on promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion among women and unrepresented minority communities. With that, I welcome uh, Dr. Bhavani. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for giving that introduction. And I would like to introduce, uh, to thank Dr. Raju for inviting me to give this talk. So I would like to share my screen. Um, so let's see, oh good. Okay, so, right. And so I think my talks follows very nicely with Dr. Vijay and Dr. Batra were talking about, but mine is more on uh, applying cybersecurity for machine learning and machine learning for cybersecurity. So my talk is going to be integrating cybersecurity and artificial intelligence. That's the first part. And then very briefly towards the end, I want to talk about why a career in cybersecurity and data science for a woman. So one thing I wanted to mention, I'm really honored to be presenting this during International Women's Day. And in fact, last year also, International Women's Day uh, in 2021, um, the Comsoc chapter in New Delhi invited me to give a presentation to celebrate women. So women have come a very long way. I think first International Women's Day, I think was about what, 100 years ago. And so women have come a very long way in the past uh, 100 years. Okay, so my talk, as I said, has got two parts, right? One is the technical part, and then very briefly, some of the, uh, the motivational part. Okay, so I'm going to talk, uh, first of all, I'm going to give a little bit of a background uh, about myself. I'm a Tamil from Sri Lanka, and I finished uh, my BSc in mathematics and physics from the University of Ceylon. So Sri Lanka used to be called Ceylon in 1975. So it's ages ago when I was barely 20 years old. And then soon after I got married in 1975 also to my husband, and he was finishing his PhD at University of Cambridge, and it was an arranged marriage. So I started as soon as I moved to the UK, uh, in England, I started my graduate work at the University of Bristol, and then later at the University of Wales in Swansea. And soon after I finished my PhD, we moved to the USA in 1980. So we moved to New Mexico. And I was offered a tenure track position in computer science at New Mexico Tech because my husband was working at the Petroleum Research Center. But I declined the position because my son was a baby. I felt that you know, it would be hard for me to cope because a new country and also taking care of my son. And I, I didn't quite understand the US tenure system. So I took visiting faculty positions in New Mexico. And later, we moved to Minnesota in Minneapolis, so at the University of Minnesota. And then after that, I got very, so my PhD was in theory of computation. So while I was at University of Minnesota um, as a visiting faculty, I also learned lots of courses on systems and uh, databases and so on. I was uh, you know, studying, uh, sort of taking these courses on the side. And so in 1983, I really wanted to work in development. So I joined Control Data Corp Corporation. It was one of the largest companies uh, in the US, or uh, in the world actually, in, uh, in uh, uh, it's a computer company. First was IBM and then DEC, and then third was Control Data, uh, had about 54,000 employees. And then after about just over two years, uh, after we finished our first release, I worked on a product called CDC Net. It was one of the first networking distributed systems, pro one of the early networking distributed systems product. And then I joined Honeywell. And that's when I was introduced to cybersecurity and data science. 
So I want to say something because I had a lucky break. Although I like development, I wanted to sort of get back into research. And so uh, three things had to happen. I became, I had to become a US citizen in 1985. Honeywell had to win that contract from the Air Force to develop one of the early secure systems. And Honeywell had to interview me and hire me. And all three things happened in the fall of 1985. So I look at it as a very lucky break. And then my career was really, you know, has been really going very strong since then. I joined the MITRE Corporation in January 1989 in Boston. And that was a fed, that's a federally funded research and development center. I did a lot of work in cybersecurity and data science. One thing to mention though, back in 1985, we didn't call it cybersecurity and data science. We call it computer security and data management. So I continued to work in these two areas it became from uh, computer security to information security to data mining, and then of course cybersecurity to data science. Was a program director at the National Science Foundation, 2001 to 2004. Professor Atlu Riorso was a program director, but I was around probably 10 years before that. And then uh, that was in Washington, DC. I joined UT University of Texas, Dallas in October, 2004 as a professor of computer science and director of computer security, sorry, cybersecurity. And I've graduated 20 PhD students. Uh, fall of uh, 2021 was my last student and 50% 10 are women. And my students also include uh, members of the African-Americans, uh, Latino-American and LGBTQ communities. And currently I've got four, maybe five PhD students and I believe three are women. And so I'm looking forward to them graduating, hopefully by 2022, a couple are graduating and the rest in 2023. Okay, I've done a lot of work for women over the years, uh, really started in 1999. Uh, I was very motivated. I attended a conference in Cape Town, South Africa and visited, that was in 1999, visited the Honorable Nelson Mandela's uh, jail cell and in Robin Island, and that really inspired, inspired me. Uh, so Professor uh, Nelson Mandela is like a role model for me. So, um, so since then I've done a lot of work, but especially the last seven, eight years, I've really devoted more of my time. So over the years, I've given lots of keynote featured addresses at outreach events. And in 19, sorry, 2016, co-chaired the Women in Cybersecurity Conference, about 800 plus, plus people, gave a featured address at, address at Women in Data Science Conference. It's a very large conference organized by Stanford University in 2018, and also a number of talks at SWE, CRAW, ACMW, WTYs, and Cyber WI mentor and many more. I'm also a member of the faculty at University of Deshang. It's in Cameroon, Africa. This was since last year. And I teach courses, it's pro bono in trustworthy machine learning. So last year, 10 days, November, December, I taught about three, three plus hours a day uh, for 10 days. So I really enjoyed teaching the students. And I also work for Professors Without Borders, also pro bono. And our first event is coming up, I believe, next, uh, next Friday on how scientists, and in my case, computer scientists, have to communicate with the general public, especially there's so much misinformation in COVID-19 time. So how to communicate to the general public. So it's a brief background, but I went uh, a bit overboard with that. So my first part is integrating cybersecurity and artificial intelligence with some applications in Internet of Things, in particular, Internet of Transportation. And part one is uh, sort of lot of lots of topics together, which is data, big data security and privacy. Uh, another project that we are working on privacy or we are quantified self. And then how do you apply data science or machine learning to cybersecurity? And then how do you secure the machine learning techniques? Because these machine learning techniques could be attacked. Part two, very briefly, what we have done on security and privacy for Internet of Transportation, and part three, some directions on applying part one to part two. And I'd like to uh, thank our colleagues, um, our sponsors, number of colleagues, professors Alvaro Cardenas, Murad Kantajalu, Latifa Khan, our former PhD student, Dr. Raul Quinones, and the project coordinator, Ms. Rhonda Walls. Okay, so integrating cybersecurity, AI, ML, data science. So some motivation. 
Uh, I believe I introduced the idea of data mining security and privacy. It was a keynote address uh, first at the IFIP 11.3 1996 in Como, Italy. I believe Professor Atluri was also there at the conference and later at the PAKDD in 1998 in Melbourne, Australia. And then I published, I call it landmark, I'll tell you why, when I was at NSF in 2002 and that spawned a new area of research. The reason I call it landmark, and I think Professor Atluri would understand, when you are a program director at NSF and you publish a paper, of course, everyone cites that paper, right? Because you are the one who is responsible for giving uh, funding. So, so that area sort of responded that new area and a lot of funding was given uh, in that area. But the word privacy preserves, the whole idea is how do you have privacy at the same time carry out data mining? Uh, so privacy preserving data mining was coined by researchers at IBM Almaden Research Center. So you have our original data. I just want to make sure my sound is, uh, sorry. Right, so you have the original data, right. And then you add noise like per term randomized. So from X, you go to X prime and then you do the data mining. But the final result, has to be the same because what's the point in carrying out data science and modifying it and instead of saying you've got cancer it says that you've got diabetes or something right the results have to be correct so that's a challenge that's the whole idea and so when i joined the university dr murat kantajalu and i we co-supervised our first phd my first phd student and i believe it is also dr murat's first PhD student, it's a woman, Dr. Lee Liu, uh, focused on privacy preserving decision trees and perturbation methods uh, between 2005 and 2008. Uh, soon after her PhD, she was a scientist at uh, eBay and so that she finished in 2008. And then she is now a big project leader, senior project leader at CVS uh, Research in Rhode Island. So, Okay, so data mining and security and privacy. Secure privacy is exacerbated with big data, right? Because you put lots and lots of data together and you can infer something that is highly sensitive or highly private. So I hosted the NSF workshop on big data security and privacy. It was in September, 2014. And then we presented the results to an interagency working group in February, 2015. And I believe that proposal for our workshop I submitted to Professor Atluri because she was the program director, I believe at that time, uh, it was in 2013 and we got some funding uh, to organize this workshop. And so workshop was held in September, 2014. Okay, so what did we do at the workshop? So our conclusions, first we said technological advances, lots of applications, we can now capture process large amounts of data, right? And also security data as well. There's massive amounts of security data. So the tasks for security will include authentication, access control, anomaly detection, and so on. So if you analyze and integrate data collected on the web, you can identify connections, relationships among individuals, homeland protection. It will help with homeland protection. It has helped with disease outbreaks like COVID. But the problem is this, you collect all the data, even if you anonymize by removing the identifiers of the records, you can sort of combine multiple records and re-identify the individuals, right? So security tasks like authentication, access control may require detailed information about users. So multi-factor authentication, you may need to collect what? Uh, fingerprint data, facial recognition, uh, the face, uh, the iris and various other aspects of a person. And so this collected information, if it's misused, it can lead to privacy breaches. So some of the directions we focused on is access control models and Dr. Atluri and Dr. Badri had, uh, had given some excellent uh, uh, presentation on one aspect of access control model, which is attribute-based access control. Then we also focused on privacy enhanced techniques, uh, big data for cybersecurity and also secure machine learning. So these were, we didn't really spend a lot of time on secure machine learning, but very briefly discussed adversarial machine learning. But there's a lot of focus now on this topic today. Lots of researchers are working in this area. Okay, so the very briefly privacy aware quantify self, right? We are carrying so many devices, the mobile device, the desktop, laptop, whatever. And so 
uh, billions of users. So there is this movement by sociologists and psychologists called the quantified self movement. And the whole idea is to give, collect a lot of information about people so that they can give advice to people, right? So for instance, if there is someone who is really a smoker and he's smoking, I mean, he or she wants to smoke and then it'll be good for, his, uh, for the information to be sent to his uh, uh, smartphone saying, no, you're not supposed to smoke, right? So that's very bad. So it'll help people a lot and also with their personal habits. But the problem is, uh, it, you have to collect lots of data about people. So when you uh, collect all this data, and often the data is collected without the user's knowledge or consent, that becomes a big problem, right? So data collected by uh, device monitoring glucose levels might be used. Insurance company could use it to deny coverage, not only to you, your children, your grandchildren. So that's really you know, very dangerous. So privacy violations could easily get out of control Right, if the data collectors could aggregate your financial and health related data from tweets, Facebook activity, and so on, it, it can cause psychological damage to people. So, what did we do? So, what do you what do you need? We need tools. While quantified self is really a good movement, we need privacy aware quantified self. And that's what we designed and developed a privacy aware policy based. And so what we said, we are all carrying uh, our smartphones with. And so we are collecting data, we are storing data, analyzing data, data sharing. So there's health data, fitness data, location, social media, and so on. Some of the data is in cloud storage, it could be encrypted, and we uh, access the data through cloud-based services, right? So the basic idea behind this is we need policies to govern data collection, policies for data storage and access, policies for data analytics, and policies for data sharing. So policies, and so when we talk about policies, we computer scientists, when we say policies, it's usually like toy policies. And I have worked in policies, we used to call them back in 1985, 86 security constraints. So I worked in this area for a long time. And often people say, okay, your policies are very uh, like childlike, you know, for children. Like you say, like you share a date, some piece of data, John will, give something to Mary, provided Mary, he tells Mary, no, you're not supposed to share with Jane. But in the real world, policies don't work that way. They are quite complex. And so we work with our policy experts. She's the dean of our School of Economics, Policy and Political Sciences. And so we have had a number of joint projects with her on policy-based information sharing, also looking at the power grid, say, in the country of Colombia. One of my teammates works with her on coming up with appropriate policies. Okay, so this is very briefly, this is what we designed and developed. So data collection, storage, access. So I've mentioned uh, early in my earlier charts. So lots of data being collected and policies will govern, uh, determine what access to give. So about data being collected, like when you are 20 years old, you may need, you may not need to weigh yourself every day, even if you put on five pounds in a day, it's not, it's not a serious concern. But when you are 70, and when you put five pounds in a day, that would be taxing to your heart. So you may have to weigh yourself daily because we don't want to keep unnecessary data. And the other point is when the data is deleted, you have to ensure the privacy, right? Uh, and also, uh, so sorry, data may have to be deleted for privacy, but when the data is deleted, you've got to ensure data is indeed deleted. And so you need to audit to make sure that say the service provider is deleting the data. And the data sharing analytics could be carried in the cloud and different scenarios, data could be encrypted and so on. So that's the, that's the first uh, aspect I wanted to talk about. And then another area of research, again, the whole idea is the first part of my talk is integrating cybersecurity and data science. So data science for cybersecurity applications and our focus is in particular big data stream classification with my colleague, Professor Latifah Khan. And what do we do here? We build, we use past data to build a classification model. It can uh, predict the labels of future instances and it helps decision making. So you might think, what is she talking? We've been doing this for 20 years. Yes, we've been doing this for, I know, since the 1990s. But the problem is at that time, we didn't know how to do big data, massive amounts of data streams. And so 
we have a big problem, lots of data, like network traffic data, sensor data, and so on, financial data arriving. It's very common in our digital world, and it's massive. So for instance, when it's massive, the concepts are going to change, right? Today, it will say by Microsoft, tomorrow by Google, the next day by Facebook, and the following day by, by Amazon or whatever. And so we have to develop continuously evolving models. So when I was a program director at NSF, we had discussions about real-time data mining, but then we didn't really have some good solutions, but now things have changed. So we develop an ensemble of classification model. We don't have one model, a collection of models. Now, lots of data arrives. As a chunk arrives, we will extract features, develop models. And if it's attacked for test data, if it is attacked, then we block and quarantine. If not, benign. Uh, we sort of store it in a server for further analysis. And one of the things is that you have expert could be in the loop, but these models, as the concepts are changing, there are different classification models. And some models like Microsoft was last week, so we throw it away, right? So currently what, what we need to buy is we are advising people to buy Google stocks, right? So again, our application, we are analyzing network traffic and cybersecurity data. So our, our app work is on uh, applying these ensemble based classification to cybersecurity data. And so here's an example of applying it to inside the thread bad people in the organization, pretending to be good people. So data chunks arrive uh, based on all of the stuff that you know people are typing suspicious stuff, but in any case, we don't know whether it's suspicious or not. We gather all the data from I, the I chunk, extract features, we use supervised learning, support vector machine and graph based uh, anomaly detection. So we build a collection of models, the bad models we throw away, and then the test data I plus one chunk comes in, we extract features and then do the testing. So it's a very similar uh, sort of uh, process, but again, the challenge here is to building the ensemble of models. So that's data science for cybersecurity. Now the problem is, Securing the cybersecurity, uh, sorry, data science machine learning. These data science techniques could be attacked, right? So we are applying, say, data science for healthcare and or machine learning, and the machine learning techniques are attacked, and it's going to give you results like you have diabetes when you really have cancer, or you have flu when you really have COVID. But that could be disastrous. So this is joint research with Professor Murat Kantajulu. So what is the adversary doing? It's trying to understand our data to defeat our learning algorithms, right? And we have to try and understand the adversary. We've got to be several steps ahead of, ahead of the adversary. It's not concept drift, right? We're not dealing with online learning. Adversaries adapting to avoid being detected. It could be during training time, during test time. So essentially we play a game adversary plays a game with us. So look what happens. What you have here, the red uh, squares are bad instances. The blue circles are good instances. This is a support vector machine boundary. Adversary is following what we are doing, learning about our models, and it's trying to push the good in bad instances to good instances. So these one, two, three, four, five red squares will not be caught, right? So that's the challenge we are faced with. So what are we doing? we are coming up with adversarial support vector machines. So again, this dotted line is the support vector machine boundary. The crosses are bad instances, the circles are good instances. And so what the adversary is trying to do is to push this towards the good instances. So these crosses are not going to be caught, right? The black dashed line is a standard support vector machine boundary. And what we are doing is trying to move the support vector machine boundary, it's a lot of mathematics involved, and pushing it to this blue line here, which is the adversarial support vector machine. So what happens, you can see here, we have the red crosses, the green circles, and so this black part, right, they trying to push, and so initially these black crosses would not have been caught, but now we have pushed this to here. So these are now bad instances. You could ask the question, we could move this right here so we can catch all the bad instances. But then if we move this blue line right here, then all the good instances will show up as bad instances. So we don't want 
false positives. We, won't, we don't want false negatives. A paper was published in ACM KDD, a threat model example, test time, deployment time. So attacker modifies X to X prime, modified packet length, you can add uh, dummy bytes, add good word to spam email and so on. Okay, so that's, that's the first part, okay? Integrating cybersecurity data science. How do we apply to internet of transportation? So very briefly, I'll, I'll touch on this because of uh, time, you know, time uh, constraints. Uh, let's see. Okay, so Internet of uh, Transportation, uh, we have, let's see, our coffee maker, tea maker, connected to television, to refrigerator, to our smartphones, to our desktop, to our clock, and so on. And so similarly, trans Internet of Things, home things, you can say. Internet of Transportation, your cars are connected to your trucks, to your... Uh, train to the trucks to roadworks and so this is really a reality now right so internet of things major implications in the transportation industry so autonomous vehicles right they improve day-to-day -day activities and they are saying uh, us alone uh, in us trucks alone carry about 63 percent of the freight of goods AVs are not just ground vehicles they include sea vehicles like submarines and ships and um, and land vehicles uh, uh, trains and cars and, and air vehicles, which are drones, airplanes, and so on, right? So their automation level varies. And so it's interesting we noted, so this is joint work with my colleague, Professor Cardenas, Alvaro Cardenas. So ground vehicles have an automation of only two, whereas um, aerial vehicles have an automation of four. So GM spent about 728 million, and they spent, yes, over in 2018, over a billion in 2019. And uh, to 2020, uh, increasing to 1 billion, 2020, I need to get the numbers 2020 and 2021. Great potential in AVs, but it comes at a, at a cost and the biggest problem is security and also privacy. So what did we do for security, right? AVs emulate the environment, variety of sensors, cameras, GPS, inertial measurement units, and so on, lead our radar. So previous research has shown that sensors are susceptible to malicious tampering like IMUs are susceptible to sound waves and GPS are susceptible to spoofing signals. So I wasn't really involved in this previous research. Dr. Cardenas was doing this work. So vehicles should verify the veracity of sensor signals before acting on them. So what are the problems? They are sensor-based, right? IOTs. So AVs rely on sensors to evaluate and interact with their environment. So what are some of the inherited issues? So there are specific attacks, right? Sensors are susceptible to GPS and transduction attacks and manipulate the environmental physical signals like visual sound and so on. So what are the defenses? So our classic computing security like memory protection and so on, so on, cryptography, you know, may not work for these types of attacks. So we need new kinds of uh, security models and then no verification. It's hard to verify because there's hardly any storage, right? And so how do you verify? But there are real-time constraints. So you need to verify in real time. So we need new methods for that. Okay, so what did we do? Uh, we built a physics-based anomaly detector for the reference monitor. That's a part of, this, uh, part of the system that controls all access. Uh, and we worked on aerial vehicles. So our algorithm, we build a model offline using the physical invariants implement an online tool uh, to, to uh, expect and observe behavior, uh, to detect anomalies, raise an alarm uh, if there's any issue. So offline pre-processing, online verification, anomaly detection. So you could ask the question again, uh, what's, the, what's the challenge in doing this, right? What's the big deal? It seems very straightforward. The challenge here is to come up with a model, right? So computer scientists, we provide you know, algorithms like, uh, uh, intrusion detection and so on, or anomaly detection. But then they have the, the, the control systems folks, so, and the cyber physical system folks, like Dr. Cardenas is excellent in control systems theory. So he came up with this model, the physical model of the aerial vehicle. It has uh, parameters like the state, input sensor measurements and so on, uh, L, the X, Y, and Z axis, moments of inertia, uh, M is mass, so various parameters. And so AVs invariants are calculated. We use well-known linear models uh, for ground vehicles, accelerometer, gyrometer, magnetometer, sensor data on the X, Y, and Z or Z axis for the aerial vehicle. 
okay, vehicle position and steering for the ground vehicles. So we did, did experiments, uh, applied algorithms for both. So what did we use? At that time, we didn't use sophisticated machine learning. We used uh, extended Kalman filter, which has been around for a while that electrical engineers, control engineers are using. It's used to predict AV's behavior by estimating unknown parameters from noisy input. The algorithm is divided into two sections that predicts and corrects estimation before it's compared against sensor data. So for anomaly detection, uh, CUSUM is a statistical algorithm is used to detect the persistent attacks and the alarm is raised if the residual difference is larger than the predefined threshold. So here is a physical implementation. You can see the we work with drones and cars. So aerial, AV, autonomous vehicle, Intel ready to fly RTF zone. We have this particular controller focused on detecting GPS spoofing and gyroscope attacks. So we detect GPS after 0.2 seconds, gyroscope after 1.5. And of course, there's an overhead involved. And for ground, we used the built on Traxxas Ford Fiesta. This is a controller focused on detecting visual attacks on the camera. It was detected after 0.1 seconds and overhead is 2.25%. And the threshold produces a probability of false alarms of 2%. Now you might think 2% is really small, but this day and age, it's not. About 15 years ago, I gave a talk and we had, we had, or, um, error rates of about 20% and they said, no, it's totally unacceptable. You should bring it down to about 5% for a different project. So today 2% is actually high. We should bring it down to maybe 0.0002%, okay? So that's the, uh, the details of security. For privacy, we really haven't started our work. We are just beginning to think about privacy. I'll tell you later what we are doing. Before the security of vehicles, we know privacy is important because uh, without a doubt, data has to be collected to study traffic jams and rerouting vehicles and so on. But when data is collected, there are privacy concerns. Okay, so, so you know some people may not want to be told. I mean, to to be spied on where they are driving or whether they are smoking in their cars. So all about their driving patterns. So we need legislatures, uh, slaters, engineers, scientists to come together and examine privacy concerns. Right, and I'll talk to you what we are doing. So, part three, very briefly, applying uh, part one to part two. Okay, so we are now looking at how to apply data science AI, what I mentioned, stream based data science to IoT applications. Okay, that's our current area of research. So, Internet of Transportation subject to attack, as I mentioned. Um, streaming data being collected. So, such systems, including autonomous and future driverless vehicles. Uh, as transportation systems go electric, we need to conserve energy. All kinds of attacks could happen, right? And they are happening. Uh, threats to such systems could cause massive damage. You can, uh, accidents, loss of lives, and so on. So data science techniques are being applied to analyze the data. So what we are investigating can stream analytics, what I mentioned earlier, for financial data and network data. Network security data can be applied to uh, to the transportation data. So again, the data is complex. I told, I specified the characteristics of the data. We did real-time verification, new memory uh, protection techniques and so on. So that's our investigation at present, okay? This second adversarial machine learning, of course, we haven't, uh, we are just about beginning also this research because internet of transportation, without a doubt, we need machine learning techniques to be applied, right? Because we have to collect all these machine learning. Uh, I mean, we have to collect so much data in order to give optimum driving directions, driving without a human in the loop and many more. And so these machine learning um, models could be attacked because the adversary is watching our models. So adversary will attempt to thwart the way our learning process. So the learning algorithms have to adapt to thwart to the adversary's actions eventually becomes game playing between the adversary and the vehicle's machine learning algorithms, right? So the challenge is what sort of game will be played? Is it zero sum game, Bayesian games, tackle big games? So we have to also understand the data. That's, the, that's one of the big challenges and research is only just beginning. So Dr. Cardin, in this particular research, I'm not involved, Dr. Cardinus and Dr. Murat Kantajalu are having a joint project. Okay, so 
A side area I want to talk about, there's a lot of, so one is when the machine learning techniques are attacked, right? You have, you focus on adversarial machine learning, applied game theory. But there's another more sort of more practical is how do you develop trustworthy machine learning algorithms, right? Because computations over big data require massive amounts of resources. So you often outsource the data. And then when you outsource the data, you don't know who you are outsourcing it to. So it could be attacked and there's man in the middle attacks. So data owners need to protect. And so research is proceeding in two directions. One, we are doing some work on uh, using Intel uh, SGX platform and our machine learning, you know, trustworthy machine learning algorithms are being executed in this trusted enclaves provided by uh, the SGX platform. So that's one way. And we need more work. Is the SGX platform really secure? That's another question. question. And also we need to explore applications of internet of transportation and infrastructures. But one area that is really getting quite prominent now, uh, and they were doing a lot of interesting work at the University of Oxford. Um, and so I was on a panel with this lady and she was uh, a professor. She was mentioning some interesting work over a year ago, but now there's more work in this area, applying formal methods. So formally analyze the machine, the specifications of the machine learning algorithms and, and verify. So trustworthy analytics, uh, applying formal methods for machine learning. So that's another area. And also what we are doing, remember I talked about privacy we are policy-based data management framework for IoT. So instead of our, cell, our smartphone, we now have a vehicle, we have radar, GPS cameras, leader, ultrasonic sen sensors, some of the encrypted data back up in cloud. So your, your device is uh, in your car and the data is collected, storage, analytics and sharing. And you can access through cloud-based services. So we are what we need to develop is sort of a privacy or we have policies. The policies have to, have to govern the data collection, data storage, data analytics, and data sharing. Okay, so summary and directions for this part before I move on to a wire career in cybersecurity for a work for women. Uh, developments in AI integrating cybersecurity and AI, it's exploding, right? Applications in AI for uh, security, like inside a threat detection and then adversarial machine learning and developments in privacy aware, healthcare, managing one's activities. I also initially had some charts on COVID applications, but you know, for lack of time, I decided just to focus on one application. I do have another presentation I gave in, actually in India a few, few weeks ago, <clears throat> sometime in mid-January about COVID applications. But in, in, in any case, with the IoT, and in particular, uh, Internet of Systems, uh, transportation systems, security and privacy solutions are being developed, but currently they are mainly physics-based solutions. So as driverless cars, as they become a reality, you need more and more AVs, right? So how can we develop, and that they will use AI, how can we develop AI machine learning solutions for detecting malware in these AV systems? That's our current research. And what we are beginning is how can adversarial machine learning work in AV systems? Can we develop a privacy aware policy-based data management framework for IoT? How can you do um, trustworthy analytics and apply formal methods? So I have only sort of discussed at a very high level. I've listed several of our papers. There is numerous opportunities for substantial research. What I have discussed in this presentation, I believe that's sufficient for 10 PhD theses, right? That's so much work to do. And so I'm hoping, maybe I'm sure you all have, some of y'all have already started this research at IIIT. Uh, and so uh, there's also lots of opportunities for several PhD students to do research in this area. Okay, so that's my first part. My second part, I've got only three or four charts and time-wise, I think, yeah, I think we are doing okay. Yes, so uh, why a career? in cybersecurity data science for a woman, right? We are all here, most of the uh, audience and participants, uh, the participants are women. And so uh, again, we have come a long way these last hundred years. Uh, and so why a career in cybersecurity and data science for a woman? So here I talk about top 10 reasons, okay? 
So why a career for cybersecurity AI for female? And I'm also including underrepresented minority. But I've got to tell you, when you say underrepresented minority, it depends from country to country. In the United States, underrepresented minority communities are the African-American, Hispanic, Latino-American, uh, LGBTQ, uh, Americans with disabilities, those with autism, they are the underrepresented minorities, right? And then of course you have the female community, right? So I'm talking for female and underrepresented minority could be different, different communities everywhere. One thing common to every country, if you are a female, right, you're female, right? So, but there are also like myself, female and women of color. So, but then I'm not considered an underrepresented minority being a South Asian, but again, I'm a female. So anyway, so this is sort of common for everyone, but I'm stressing more on female. So given the opportunity, women and underrepresented communities, we can excel in any computing field, cybersecurity and data science, very exciting fields. They are lucrative fields and with so many innovations. Uh, it can be integrated with arts, humanities, natural science, social science, engineering, business, medicine, law, you name it. So sometimes people may have, uh, may like to work in social sciences area. Yes, you can apply data science for social, uh, social science. And there are also some security implications like in engineering and business and so on. Okay, many options. We can do research from academia, product development, and I've worked in product development. We can also do work in uh, industrial research. We can do startup. I did one startup, but uh, you know it, it wasn't uh, uh, it wasn't successful. I mean, it was just we didn't really even go for funding. Just develop the we kept developing our, our, our technology for a never and never, and you can't make that mistake. When you work in computer science, you've got to get your product out. You've got to get your customers, right? So I'm hoping to start another, hoping for another startup, maybe in a couple of years, then I will learn from the previous mistakes. And so get your system out and get the customers uh, and then you will get uh, funding. So that's the main thing. Anyway, so we have that opportunity too. So at least I'm happy I tried. And millennial women and underrepresented communities and beyond, they have the flexibility and freedom to choose careers, right? And have female underrepresented role models, right? When I was growing up in Sri Lanka uh, and also being a Tamil, we were not sort of exposed to many things. Uh, I'm sure in India, there were many more, you know, sort of exposure to many more uh, things going on around the world. At that time, we are talking about almost, you know, almost 45 years ago, but, uh, nowadays, regardless of where you are, with the internet, you have access to so many uh, careers in the sense, knowledge about the careers, right? So for us, it was either you become a medical doctor, you become an engineer, or you become an accountant. Even lawyers weren't actually, they, although there was a lot of demand for lawyers, by the 1970s, not so much demand. It's either doctor, engineer, or an accountant. So when I was doing mathematics and physics, my relatives said, gosh, why are you going to, why are you doing that, right? What's the point? I mean, what sort of job are you going to get? So, but then we had computer science. Of course, mathematics made a major role today with quantum computing, physics is going to make, play a major role. So there are so many opportunities out there. You've got to follow your passion, right? So, so STEM field is very important, but you also have underrepresented, sorry, you also have role models in your communities now. And in my time, we didn't have these role models. So in many research areas, so this last point was not, it's after the COVID, we can all work from home. In fact, if you're professors, we were like this afternoon, I've got to show up at work to teach my class. So, uh, but you know, before COVID, we, you know, computer scientists could stay at home and do almost all of their work. All you needed is a laptop and the internet you need were lap laptop and the internet connection, right? But after COVID, everybody's working from home. Even doctors are working from home, seeing patients, although they have to have you know face-to-face -face interaction. Lawyers are working from home, uh, you know, uh, defending clients in courts. So this last point is a little bit. Uh, you know, not, not as relevant today. Okay, continuing, many cybersecurity, data science, AI jobs cannot be overtaken by robots because we are the ones who are developing these robots. We need researchers, developers to collect and analyze massive amounts of data from IoT uh, systems. Cybersecurity, data science, without a doubt, they are highly paid fields, numerous jobs, right? So why not females and underrepresented communities take advantage? 
And as a result, female underrepresented communities can be financially independent with a career in cybersecurity data science, in computer science in general. And financial independence means self-respect, less stress, more confidence. And this is something I always stress. As I said, I've spoken to many, many, many women's groups. I always say financial, having financial independence is a must for everyone, regardless man or woman, but it's especially true for women because you hear about women getting abused in marriages. And so if you, and they are stuck because they don't have the financial independence. If you have the financial independence, then you have the choice. Do you want to stay in a marriage or do you want to leave your spouse, right? So that's the choice that you have. And it's really good with education and careers. Women now these days have these choices. So computing systems are everywhere from north to south, east to west. Therefore, these systems can be attacked and you need to make the world a better and safer place with cybersecurity, including addressing one of the major problems that we are having facing about violence against women and children. And we can apply technologies. Uh, and in, in a recent, I think about a year and a half ago, I gave a keynote address at the ACM, sorry, a, a special address at the ACM Coda Spy Conference. Uh, and to talk about, um, because if, if you don't have security and privacy, can artificial intelligence and machine learning be really be good, especially when it comes to protecting women and children? Okay, so we need women, this is my last chart, I believe, uh, women and underrepresented minorities in both cyber, I talk about cybersecurity and data science because they are the areas I'm working. There are so many opportunities and I talked about lots of research areas, lots of opportunities for development and yes, startups also. And yet so few women and members from a minority communities work in these fields in the United States. Uh, only around 10% are in cybersecurity and even fewer from minority communities. Uh, the percentage of women in data science is slightly better, AI. There are about more than 20%. I would even say about 25, but I, I feel more safe to say just over 20. The percentage of working uh, in this highly lucrative field from the minority communities, they are saying even less. And women and those from minority communities, they are really losing out by not getting more into these fields intellectually, but also financially. So we urgently need mentors to motivate the members from these diverse communities and encourage them uh, to get into these important fields. We, we can do it if we all work together. One last chance. So what advice do I want to give, right? I've been, in, been working for around 40 years now. And so I'm saying, do not be undermined by others. That is when they say women or people from minority communities, women of color are not good in STEM. Do not be uh, discouraged, right? Because you are as good or better than any of them. Never give up when others, even women, put you down. There are sometimes women put other women down. Work hard, set goals, but be flexible. Because remember, life does not turn out the way we want it to. Especially for women, you know, we, you know, when we get married and we are the ones who have children. And so you always have to make those trade-offs. But one of the things I did every time I was, I talked about my background, I took advantage of all the opportunities. Even when I took, uh, when I had visiting faculty positions, I wrote nine journal papers in theory of computation, uh, theoretical computer science, and some journal papers in distributed systems as well, with some adjunct faculty position at University of Minnesota when I was in industry, uh, especially at the development job. So you've got to uh, take advantage. And because I wrote all the papers, almost 24 years later, uh, I got the tenure, tenured uh, full professor position. Uh, love your work, but also enjoy life. There has to be this work-life balance for all of us, right? So now I'm a grandmother with small grandchildren. So I'm reading up on how to carry, uh, how to do a, how to work full time and still uh, have a work-life balance with grandmothers. So there are two books I'm reading now. One I just finished, it's a bit depressing, Grandmothers at Work, um, Work-Life Balance for Grandmothers at Work. I thought it was going to be really a fun book, but I find grandmothers are working 40 hours then taking care of grandchildren for 20 hours because their children are either divorced or they have to go to school or they have got to struggle two jobs to make ends meet. And so grandmothers are dipping into their savings. So it was a little bit uh, disappointing, but that's what's happening in real life. 
The other book is sort of a very prominent lady, Lizzie Stahl. She's a high paid journalist. She's talking about all the fun times she's having with her grandchildren. Of course, some others are commenting, Miss Stahl, not every one of us are white and privileged like you, right? So there are struggles, but you know, we have to try and balance this, balance uh, uh, what life throws at us, but also be positive and take advantage of whatever you can, right? One more paper if you can write, it's better than zero papers, right? So be a role model to younger women, help the younger women and your community and learn from the successful women and members of your community. Even though you may get into administration and that's important, I'll tell you why. Because I was encouraged a lot to get into administration, especially at my time I was given, I was a department head and they wanted me to be division director and so on. But I really like technical work, but at least I'm glad I tried because I don't think at that time, at least, maybe now it might be a bit different. I'll be open to management positions now, but at that time of my career, and that was what, 25 years ago, I really wanted to do more technical work. But it's, if you really love management, get into management. Why? Because let's say there's a dean position that's becoming vacant and there are 10 people competing. There are nine, nine of the department heads are men and one department head is a woman. Who do you think will get the dean job when there are nine men, right? The chances are very likely one, a man would get the job. If there are five men and five women, or seven, then there's a 50-50 chance. If there are seven women and three men, you see the improvement because if you become deans or vice division directors and vice presidents in company, then uh, get to be president of a university or a president of a company, then you could help more women, right? So because I am a woman, I give talks to all these women motivational address and hopefully I can motivate them. And, uh, and sort of hire more female, as a professor, hire more female students, more female faculty. Female faculty, by the way, is really difficult to hire because you know, they are so scarce and a lot of other people, universities also want them. But in any case, get into management if you are passionate. But you also have to keep yourself technical, right? Even if you go to the top, you don't want people to say, oh, she's not technical, she's just a manager. So, but then if you really want to do technical work, 100%, I really want to continue with technical work. You should do technical work for a little longer and then get into management. As I said, now my, you know, after 40 years, I feel that I really want to do management, but now, you know, getting into management, you know, can I get a sort of a good management position? So I'll try. If I get, then it'll be great. If I don't, at least I try. That's the important thing. Most important, find mentors, okay? Talk to people. I give a whole uh, other talk I've given on mentoring, the role of mentoring for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mentoring is so important. And my last, oh, this is the, the, my colleagues who work with me on the technical aspects, uh, uh, Alvaro Cardenas uh, on cyber, uh, cyber physical systems and IoT, Murat and adversarial machine learning, Latifa, Professor Latifa on uh, data science for cybersecurity, Dr. Raul Quinones, uh, he's a PhD student. He works for a cyber physical system company and Rhonda Walls is our program director. So I tried to pack a lot of stuff in, in this presentation. Let's see. Uh, so that sort of ends my presentation. How do I get back into this? I'm always getting, okay. So are there any questions at this time? Okay, I, I, Dr. Radhika, right, I will leave it to you now. Uh, let's uh, see, I'm going to stop. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. Yeah. Or, yeah. Okay. So, so that was really an inspiration, inspirational talk. Uh, you can hear me, right? Yes, I can, uh, I can. Yeah, Dr. Yes, Bhavani, can you hear? yes, yes, yes. Thank yeah. you so much. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much for the talk. It was uh, really inspirational and very motivating, actually. Uh, so there are two questions. Uh, yeah. uh, are you able to see or shall I read it? Yes, for you? I am. Okay, great talk, Professor. Thank you. Are we well equipped to prevent rogue attacks on connected AV trains? How will 5G help affect this? So that's a, uh, that's a very good question. So are we well equipped to prevent rogue attacks? Absolutely not. I mean, there's every time we try to find one solution, the attackers are 
you know, several steps ahead of us. So that's a big challenge, right? And how will 5G help affect this? 5G helping in some aspects, okay, tra uh, transmission and so on, and 5G as you know, providing better security, but 5G also has got many security concerns. And one of my colleagues, uh, Professor Elisa Bertino is now an expert in 5G security, and she has uh, published several papers of all the attacks to 5G. So will 5G help? It will help from the technology point of view, but is 5G better? It's providing better security features, but then is 5G going to solve the problem? 5G is also susceptible to attacks. So I don't want to paint a bleak picture because if we don't do anything, then yes, the attackers would win. But you know, we have to sort of do the best. So the question, the, the answer here is we are not well equipped. Equipped. We are getting better equipped, but it's never going to end because otherwise we are not going to have jobs, right? But no, it's not because of that. Because as we make progress, new technologies are coming, 5G, uh, cell phones and smartphones and novel techniques and, and big data solutions. As we develop these new technologies, the hackers are going to find a way to attack our technologies. So as a result, it's never going to be over. So I don't think we can ever have a secure system. One thing I'm really frightened about is quantum computing, because if it really works and they are all predicting it's going to work, then with encryption, we can have at least confidentiality and we can also break the, but the problem is, no, no, sorry, we can't, we can't have, we can handle the ran, ransomware attacks, right? Because we can encrypt uh, the, because somebody can encrypt all our work, we can decrypt it, right? With quantum computing, it will take maybe milliseconds to decrypt something that would have cost us uh, uh, millions of years to decrypt, but because of that, we are not going to have encryption. If we don't have encryption because everybody can um, decode it, then decrypt, then what's the point in having encryption? So I'm worried that while it's going to provide solutions to some security problems, we are going to have even worse security problems. So we need to see what, what's going to happen, right? So I hope I answered your question. The second question is brilliant philosophical insights. What would be the effect for adversarial infringements? Okay, that's good. If instead of a single model, you have multiple models running different algorithms and you accept a decision only if a majority of models agree on prediction. That is a excellent uh, question because that is exactly what we are doing, right? Because if a majority of models, right, agree on a prediction, then that's the model that we are, we are considering and we throw away if majority of the models uh, say that this is a bad, new model is bad, then we throw it away. Or an old model is getting bad, then we throw it away. But it's an interesting question that you are asking about adversarial infringements, because that's really something that we haven't thought about. So you've given me some, some food for thought, some ideas. So that's, again, uh, something that I think we need to look at, because... Right, because what, what, what's happening is that when these models are making decisions, there could be infringements and those decision making could be thwarted, right? So that is something that we haven't considered in our current research, but something that we need to think about. Because again, what, what I mentioned was just one model. So our current research of adversarial machine learning is one model and within that model, Right, we are talking, we are also looking at specific attacks. We have a free range attack, and then we also have a, uh, a targeted attack. But in the reality, two classes. You could have multiple classes of attacks and multiple models. So what you're asking is an excellent question. Sorry, y'all are really far advanced. We haven't, uh, we haven't um, sort of explored the multiple model problem. So that's an excellent question. We need to, we need to think about that. Uh, and then uh, let's see the third one. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Thanks for very much. Uh, is there a general template in the community for robust okay, or resilient machine learning models that can defend against adversarial uh, machine learning, especially those from perturbations or deployment models? So remember, I'm talking about this trustworthy machine learning, right? Trustworthy machine learning is going beyond right, security going beyond. So we these machine learning systems, 
have to be trustworthy. That means handle attacks. They have to maintain privacy. They have to maintain uh, fault tolerance. That means if they, are, if they crash, they have to recover. Crash could be through some mistakes or the crash could be because of some, some attack. So they have to recover, okay? And bias, there could be bias. So there has to be a fairness factor. So there are algorithms being developed by introducing a fairness factor. The data has to be accurate. So the data could be attacked or the integrity of the algorithms, the data and the algorithms. Data could be attacked or there could be um, sort of bad data people are entering by mistake. So these machine learning algorithms could hand, should be able to handle everything. And right now we are only focusing on one aspect, either it's security or it's privacy, maybe fault tolerance, maybe integrity, more and more looking at fairness. How do you put everything together? That is going to be the sort of like a million dollar question, right? It's really hard. And I think that's, uh, you know, that's another very good question. So I think that's, that's sort of, I sort of, you'll have asked very thought provoking questions. So these are good ideas that you'll have provided that many of us can work on. So you'll have given me sort of, it's sort of a two way. Hopefully I, I have imparted some of my knowledge and in these questions, you'll have imparted some of your knowledge also to me. So we, can, we should all work on these challenging problems together. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. Uh, anything else, uh, Dr. Radhika? Yeah, I don't see any more questions. Uh, that was a wonderful talk. Uh, now I hand over to Dr. Gopal and uh, Dr. Raju. Yeah, Professor Gopal, if you are going ahead. Uh, yes, please uh, go ahead, Raj. Oh. So it was, uh, uh, I must first thank Professor Vikram Puri for having suggested the speakers of this day. And uh, uh, Dr. Bhavani, Dr. Vijay Rishmi, and Dr. Gunjam Bhatta, you have, you have given us uh, more than uh, food for the thought. Uh, I also thank Professor Radhika and uh, Dr. Charu for uh, moderating the sessions. And I thank, uh, no, I can even thank all the members who have presented here in the main session, main forum. Dr. Vrinda, Sarita, Faima, uh, Budreshwar. And I also thank the IT staff at uh, IIIT and also Rifna for having, for working with the controls at the rear. Uh, just a small announcement, uh, uh, we'll have uh, on March 21st, we, the International Day on Eliminating Racial Discrimination is coming up. So we are planning to have a, a talk also on March 21st. And before I conclude, I must thank Professor Gopal Krishnan and all my colleagues at uh, Innovation Hub for having sponsored and encouraged uh, us to take care of this seminar. Thank you. I'm wishing you all a good day for those who are joining from the US and good night for all of us who are in India. Thank, thank you very, very much. much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for giving us the thank opportunity. You. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You, Dr. Thank you, Vijay. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so you. much. Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye.